thank you all for joining. Thank you also for the really interesting Google Docs, which has made me want to change everything I was planning to say, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about what I think we've experienced since we launched our report. When, it feels like a lifetime ago, in April 2017, I launched an inquiry into the future of civil society. I said this was going to be a major listening exercise. We didn't have all the answers and we made a commitment to be both humble in that we were listening really carefully and bold in what we reported on. And through an 18 month period, we were very public about what we were finding, but we launched in November, 2018. And in many ways that feels like a lifetime ago. It's a bit of a cliche, but the last three months we have changed more than we probably have in the last 30 years. So in one sense, revisiting that work feels very odd. But there are things that we talked about then that I think we really need to focus on now because the now is changing, but it's also confirming stuff. that I think all of us active in civil society, whether in tiny local community organizations or massive institutions, knew then and know now. What do we say? We said there was strong civil society everywhere, that there were no cold spots, that everywhere across England, remember this was about England, there were networks of people doing stuff. Whether they were singing in choirs or digging allotments or running voluntary organisations, people were active and engaged. And three months ago, we saw an explosion of social solidarity. Now, some of it was brilliant. Some of it was not so good. You know, stockpiling loo paper, probably not our finest hour. But actually, across the country, government, local authorities, and the health service woke up and realised just how dependent they were on active, engaged community social solidarity. Without that activity, the whole thing would have collapsed and we have come pretty close to collapse. But actually, what happened at neighbourhood level seems to me to show what we said then. We also said that there was a major scar across the country and across civil society, and that was racism. And we published, I think, a really important report, one of the three we reported on, saying we need to talk about race. We said white people needed to take responsibility for the racism in our sector and in our society. Those two messages could not seem to me be more timely. What else did we say? We said that place and space really matters, that most people live most of their lives locally. And the one thing we've learned in the last three months is how important the local and the hyper-local is and how much we miss and mourn the access to the shared spaces that we have and that we need to treasure, but we're becoming so atrophied. We said that the future of work was going to be one of the really big challenges we faced. And now with what I perceive as rather glib talk, oh, everyone can work from home, and the new definition of poverty being people who have to go out to work because they can't sit in their own homes and work because of the nature of the work they do. The nature of work has changed and will change. And I think we were absolutely right to say work really mattered. We said that a sense of identity and belonging was what animated and motivated civil society. And although most of it is local, there are also networks that grow across the country, indeed across the globe. I think we've seen that coming out. And we've said that there was a growing tension, which could be really productive, or it could be rather destructive, between organisations, established bodies, and the movements and networks that are powering change within civil society. I don't think we were wrong on any of that. And what we said we would see in the future, which we described as increasingly uncertain, and I read the report again yesterday, we talked about cyber security, we talked about economic volatility, we talked about climate shocks, we didn't talk about a pandemic, we didn't get that. Or we talked about major economic crisis brewing. In all of that, we said civil society had to step into the space, not wait for permission from government, but take action. And I think what we've witnessed in the last three months is precisely that, because largely government at all levels has been in a state of disarray and dependence. And we concluded by saying that what really mattered for social solidarity, for strong, vibrant civil society that could steer us through our increasingly troubled future was a new set of behaviours, attitudes and practices. And we got some flack at the time of announcement. In fact, I continue to get some flack about this because we didn't say government should fix everything. My mantra has always been better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And we said we will get on and do some stuff.
But in order to do that, we need to change. And the dimensions we talked about change under were what you've all discussed, the pact. Now, I think power really matters, not because power is a bad thing. Civil society has grown out of people aggregating their power. What is a trade union except people bringing their power together to press for social change? What is a tenants association except a group of people pushing for power? But that power had got stuck in some places, wasn't distributed properly, and that people were not conscious enough or using their power in the best way. We argued for a fundamental shift of power, recognition that the local, the social, the mobile is where real change happens and we need to support it. I think we've learned a lot about that in the last few months. We talked about a new approach to accountability, a sense that for many people in civil society, and I'll put my hand up to it, I've had four decades in this sector, we've got too used to being accountable to our funders, accountable to our regulators, worried about what government thought about us but actually the real accountability that matters is to the people you exist to serve to support to engage with and i argued at the time that the real test of strong civil society was how accountable it felt to what in traditional charity law are called our beneficiaries we argued for a much stronger sense of human connection both within organizations but actually critically across civil society because my time is running out, so I'll come to the final bit of the pact. Lack of trust within civil society seemed to us then, 18 months ago, to be hampering us in our really important purpose. The fact that there is so much tension between established organisations and new and emergent ones. The fact that smaller organisations just don't believe, and I think they're right, that the big organisations have got their back and will support them. The fact that the networks between the very major household name institutions and the smaller organisations are so frayed. All ends up with a lack of trust and that makes us much less strong than we need to be. Now we argued then that civil society needs to change because the agenda in front of us is so massive. We have a torn social fabric which has been exposed dramatically over the last few months. I read somewhere somebody saying this pandemic has been like an x-ray on society. Well it's shown stuff that everybody in this chat and everybody in civil society knew was happening already. Gross inequality. We need to address it because it's bad for trust, it's bad for society. We said that the only way we would get ready to avert the catastrophe of climate crisis was through strong civil society. And the only way we would deal with the economic volatility that we were then predicting was through strong civil society. Now I believe, and I think the evidence of the last three months absolutely backs me up on this, that where civil society is strong, where it's capable, where it has energy and drive, it can transform things and we can really live up to the challenge we face. But where it's timid, where it's easily knocked off course, where it's waiting for permission, it's not able to step into that space. And I think the real challenge we face is not the last three months of lockdown, it's how we get any recovery out of it. And that's why I was so keen we should have this early discussion with people who are close to this agenda so what is it we do next to make sure the civil society, which has been shown to be powerful, resourceful and strong, which has also been shown to be lacking in resilience, easily knocked off course and riven with some of the same inequalities um, that we know we address in society. What can we do next to um, end that? And I'll end by saying that when charities so white say that 90% of black and minority ethnic charities and voluntary organisations will not exist when we emerge from lockdown, that's a real warning to all of us in civil society that unless we pay really close attention, we won't be fit for this continuing uncertain future. Thank you, Louise.